Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, here, here at the John Hope Franklin Center, where we're joined by Professor Treva B. Lindsay, <laughs> Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the <laughs> Ohio State University, a 2010 history PhD from Duke University, and the author of Colored No More, Reinventing Black Womanhood in Washington, D.C., published by the University of Illinois Press. How are you doing? I'm Professor doing all right. Lindsay? It's good to see you. So, you're a DC girl. Yes. You're a Sidwell girl. <laughs> you had to travel all the way to Duke University and to teach at the University of Missouri and the University and the Ohio State University to write a book about your home. Yes. <laughs> it's such an interesting journey. I didn't come to Duke expecting to write a book about Chocolate City, <laughs> but I found myself doing all of this work around black women and looking at the late 19th century, looking at the early 20th century, and really starting to discover my foremothers in a very mm, fascinating mm, way. Mm. Whether it was that they went to Oberlin College, right? Because if you were a black woman getting a college degree in the mid to late 19th century, chances are you went, went to Oberlin. Oberlin. Right. And then seeing how many of these women ended up in Washington, D.C. And then I'm now thinking, okay, that school is called Slow Elementary School. This way is Anna Julia Cooper way. And there were all of these ways that these black women kept showing up and kept haunting me in the best way possible, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. should say. And their stories seemed largely untold. And so I was very interested in saying, what would it mean to map these women and to use these women as a way to not just center the importance of Chocolate City and how it became Chocolate City, but particularly how black women shaped the nation's capital. Mm -hmm. This is also a book about black institutions. Yes. And, and whether we're talking about Howard University or, or the S Street Salons, yes. right? The way that black women use their view of the world to be able to move black institutions forward. Um, Absolutely. Talk about some of the women who were really important in, in this regard. Sure, so you have women like Lucy Dick Slow, mm -hmm. who was the first dean of women at Howard University, who is so badass in so many ways, it's almost <laughs> disappointing that there had been so little work beyond the work of someone like Alinda Perkins before my book, and now a mm -hmm. full-length biography exists of her. But she's the first black woman to win a national championship in tennis. She is the first president of Alpha Kappa or Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She is someone who pushes Howard to form a women's campus to emphasize that black women come mm -hmm. to these schools and not only challenge themselves to become leaders in their community, but understanding the unique position that black women would have that was different even from black men or white women in the modern world. She talked a lot about the modern world. She also had a partner who was a woman, a playwright and uh, artist in her own right, uh, Mary Burrill, who he shared, she shared her life with. <laughs> And she came up against Howard's first black president, Mordecai Johnson, in a few different clashes, so much so that he was not invited to her funeral when she passed. She was wow. very specific about that. And so it's pushing this institution that is regarded as this progressive and dynamic institution, black institution, by people all over the country, by black folks all over the country, to check itself about its gender politics. Mm -hmm. And it's asking Howard to truly be progressive and pro-black in the ways that include black women and black queer folks back in the 1920s. And interestingly enough, we're still having these conversations around black institutions right. and intracommunal right. right. gender politics and sexual politics. When you talk about this legacy piece, um, do you think, I mean, is there a way to imagine like a speculative world where these women are in the 19th, 20th century and they're trying to imagine a Treva Lindsay? Hmm. Um, and if they are imagining a, a Treva Lindsay, what are they imagining in the 21st century? I would Partic like particularly to around so. this history work. Yes, I would like to think so. I would like to think that a lot of the women who are doing this, who are keeping these papers, who are being visible in public in certain ways, were creating an archive for us to mine, to create, and to build this robust field mm -hmm. now of black women's history. I, it's incredible to see all of this work that's coming out yeah, right, of people right. doing work around black women's lives from 
enslavement to now, to seeing the different ways, the different approaches to this. I'm heartened to be a part of that group of women. Mm -hmm. And I tell my students all the time, and particularly my students who are interested in pursuing the academy or doing activist work or doing any kind of public work that you right now are doing ancestral work because you are going to become someone's ancestor. And so if you imagine that as a way to think about the kind of work that we do and that kind of critical imagination speaks back to our foremothers who had to be able to imagine yeah, yeah. that they were doing the work that allowed for us to do more work and that's all connected to this idea of freedom, yeah. this idea of justice, this idea that if black women get free, we all get free, right? It's the refrain from the yeah. Kabahi River Collective Statement that resonates so profoundly in this moment. There's a little white paperback called The Black Poets. And, yes. and I don't think anybody who's ever read <laughs> black poetry does not have a copy right. of this. <laughs> um, but before I bought that book as a teenager, I, I had gotten from the library a little book on Negro poetry. Um, one of the poets I was introducing that book was Georgia Douglas Johnson. Yes. Um, and, and her work had stayed with me for a long time so much so that I can remember watching Avery Brooks in his television <laughs> <Yeah>. show, <laughs> A Man Called Hawk. Yes. You know, almost <laughs> a decade later. And, and it's interesting because Avery Brooks's mom went to Oberlin. Yes. Right. And so it talks about, in some ways, it speaks to what he knows about that culture there. And so he does a whole episode that's about saving and making a landmark. Yes. Douglas Johnson's home which was the site of this S Street Salon. Talk about what it meant to create, you know, we, we talked a little earlier with Britt Russard, who talked about how black women engaged in thinking about and writing about science yes. in these par semi-private parlor spaces in right. the 19th century. <laughs> I mean, Johnson's creating this same kind of world in the S Street Salon, and, and everybody's aware of it, because Du Bois is taking the train down, and Absolutely. James Holden Johnson is like, <laughs> folks understand that this is kind of the place where it's happening, but folks aren't really talking about what that space was and how significant it was sure. to black literary production and cultural production at that moment. Absolutely, it's a home in one way that black women create, as you said, these semi-private and in certain ways what becomes semi-public spaces because what comes out of there mm -hmm. become these works that are transformative, that are mm -hmm. thinking about everything from birth control to lynching to family dynamics. They're touching on all of the hot button issues in uh, black public life, in, in American life, mm -hmm. and questions of democracy that are coming out of that. And to imagine that this black woman, Georgia Douglas Johnson, opened up her home to create a space, particularly for black women, to think, to create, to produce, to be soundboards for one another, to mm -hmm. engage one another, to think about the importance of collaborative and connected work as a way, as an ethic, right? As a, as a principle for the ways that black women create. That it's not in this isolated way in which we think about intellectual production, but in community, mm -hmm. in service of community that we're doing this. And then to have some of the big folks that we think about from that period, period of time coming down to be a part of this, to witness this, and more importantly, to bear witness yeah. to these yeah. black women who were doing these work, doing this work, asking these questions, pushing these conversations mm -hmm. forward, and doing it in a way that I think we have yet to fully reckon with the significance of this space existing for as long as it did, and that it was shaped by and largely populated by black, black women. women. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined by <laughs> Professor Trevor Blaine Lindsay, <laughs> Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at The Ohio State University. The author of Colored No More, Reinventing Black Womanhood in Washington, D.C. I want to shift gears a little bit, uh, right. a little light first and then a little more, okay. less light. Um, but Baychella, um, <laughs> and, and particularly I'm struck by the kind of intervention that Beyonce made at Coachella, yes. um, bringing to the forefront and, and as part almost of a national conversation, the significance of HBCUs. Yes. Um, whether that was the four marching bands <laughs> that performed, um, or her beginning her performance with the, the quote unquote Negro National Anthem, Lift yes. Every Voice and Scene, um, in some ways bringing this kind of part of black life that's in the deep recesses of the white imagination yes. to the forefront in ways that I think only she could have. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, Beachella, you know, there's a, it's a special artist that will wake me up at 2.30 in the morning to watch a live stream with almost 500,000 other people around the world to see what she will do and how she will top herself. And the fact that she took this opportunity, even at the kind of trepidation of her own mother about centering blackness in such an explicit dynamic and um, just overt way throughout the performance, that she did that unapologetically. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating to watch her become more unapologetic, more unabashed in this. So she moves from freedom, her own kind of freedom song that she creates from the Lemonade Project, in which the video features mothers of black people slain by police officers into the Black National Anthem, the Negro National Anthem, Seamlessly, I, I, this arrangement, I think, will now become an arrangement that perhaps people will recognize and you see this spike in people searching, what is this song that Beyonce right, right, singing? Right. And, you know, I'm in an apartment standing up because it came on, the reverence, and at a moment where there's all of this controversy around athletes kneeling right, during right. the anthem in protest to racist police brutality. And then she goes into formation, right? Which is this song where people are like, oh my gosh, she's black. She's, right, she's really right, black, right? right? right she's right, claiming right. this status as a black woman. And then having marching bands, Jay setting, um, the, the music references that mm -hmm. are in there, everything from Fela Kuti to Nina Simone on the night in which she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to gutter gutter to Pastor Choi, Juvenile. Right. There's a deep Southern part yep, of that's yep. part of this where a lot of our historically black colleges and universities are located. And also there's something deeply diasporic about mm -hmm. the a mm -hmm. way that she moves through the performance as well. And I think in addition to having such a strong HBCU presence there, what's also part of this is how important HBCUs are in terms of maintaining and producing culture and being a space in which black students primarily are educated about the mm -hmm. wealth mm -hmm. of creativity, of ingenuity, of innovation that comes out of these spaces. And so to locate not only in historically black college and universities, but in black genius and black creativity, um, historically and contemporarily, I think was bold, but it was also perfect yeah. for this moment. Are you surprised by the trajectory of her career, her maturation process. You know, there's a way I think that when you yeah. when you go back to 1998, 1999, and you listen to Des Destiny's Child, it was clear vocally that she was a unique voice, right? Sure. That, that we would be listening to in any kind of context for a long time. But now that we have, you know, something that's even beyond a brand. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> I, we were joking in the conversation how Snoop has become a, a lifestyle <laughs> brand. But Beyonce is even more than that, yes. right? You know, are you surprised by the trajectory of her career? I am. I am. I don't think I saw Beyonce Knowles, Destiny's Child, No, 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 <laughs> um, turning into what many would argue, and I certainly would argue, our greatest living entertainer. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I saw that coming to the extent, the fandom that we see around her. And that evolution from, I don't ever think she shied away from black cultural traditions or black expressivity. I think over the course of her career, however, the way she's dipped into that and the way she's pulled from those spaces, whether it's DJ Screw and Chopped and Screw, mm -hmm. her being in the Willie D video back in the day, thinking about Dookie Braids and all of these other signifying moments, I don't think she's ever shied away from that. I just think as she's progressed and become the icon that she is, mm -hmm. the single name phenomenon that she is, that it's become really important for her to say, I'm going to use this stage, use this platform to show all of these cultural influences and to explore. Beyonce is also a dialogic artist. She's in conversation with us. Right, she's right, hearing our critiques. Right. She's hearing um, the praise. She's hearing all of this. And there are various ways that she engages that. So social media also makes for a different landscape in which to process someone like Beyonce and to think about the kinds of archives that she's mining, mm -hmm. engaging, and conversations that she's a part of. Mm -hmm. Whether that's you're a fan or not a fan, it's really important to demarcate to that as significant. Her emergence also, uh, current emergence, right, when we think about her, you know, say Michelle Obama, yes. probably the most recognizable black woman in the world, but this is also coming in the shadow of a heightened sense of black women's trauma, right? Yes. And it's not as if black women haven't been experiencing trauma for a long time in this country, right. but our sense of it and our perceptions of it have changed because of social media. Yes. Um, given that moment, 
that we're dealing with a figure like Beyonce, mm -hmm. um, you as a scholar um, who's deeply committed as an activist to addressing these issues and of course also using your scholarship yes. to address these kind of images, um, there's always the question of, you know, what does sustainability look like for you on a personal level? Yes. Right, you know, how, again, self-care being this kind of term that so many of us are talking about embracing now, I mean, what does that mean for you trying to do this work under this environment? It means developing a robust practice of care. And some of that isn't even a self-care for me. Sometimes I feel like I'm so depleted of self that I don't even have the tools necessary to do it, yourself, to do it myself and to have people in my community accountable for making sure I'm mm -hmm. caring for myself and caring for one another, to building in a sense of waking up and watching Beachella was something that provided a level of joy amidst writing a project about black women in, his, in, in histories of violence against black women. That it's important that I don't wake up or go to sleep writing or thinking about those right, things, right, but right, thinking right. about possibility, thinking about joy, thinking about happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, so important to do because as I first began this work around black women and violence, I didn't have a care practice. And I could feel it um, somatically having an impact on my life. I wasn't sleeping well, mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling like myself entirely. And so I had to say, I need to take a step back and figure out a, a plan, a way to go about this that still centers black women's pain and trauma, but also being a part of a collective founded by Joan Morgan called the Pleasure Ninjas, that mm -hmm. that was also part of my work, that was also part of my practice. I can't watch all of the videos and watch um, yeah. and read all of the stories about all of the incidences of violence against black women. I'm thinking right now just about the incident at the Waffle House that happened with Jakezia Clemens and seeing the lack in certain ways of robust response Watch in the way that, that we responded to Starbucks and how police respond to black women, black women on the golf course. It just, I'm, we're adding to the list of what it means to right. being black here. The wine train. The wine train, ago. but it's so important for me to make that statement of being a black woman here. Mm -hmm. And there's a range of experiences that comes with and somehow, in spite of all of these things, we still find these ways, as my wonderful colleague, um, Bianca outlines certain ways to create happiness, yeah. to facilitate yeah. happiness, but I think it's just as important to balance that with the complexity of the ways that black women experience this world and continue to be critical patriots, to use Salamisha Tillis language, despite yeah. the onslaught of violence. So I've never, and, and, and I've known you now for 14 years, yes. um, <laughs> and I've never seen you blush, right, and I don't expect you to blush now, um, but when I was teaching this, your book, uh, with the undergraduates, and I said, uh, Google Professor Bay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> and, and, and just like, there's a collective hush around the class. Oh. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, how has it been trying to, to manage being taken as a serious scholar? an activist where there's also a world where you're known as Professor Bay. <laughs> I try and laugh a lot about it. I try and force conversations, particularly as a black feminist, about the ways we talk about pretty politics, beauty, right. erotic capital. It's a very uncomfortable And these are the issues that black women have always had to deal with in terms of how they're embodied in the classroom. Absolutely. What they wear, what they don't wear, how they engage Absolutely. students. Absolutely. Right. How we're policed, what Black feminine artifice is, whether if you're not presenting with black feminine artifice, what are all of the right. different ways that black women, black femmes, black trans folks show up right. in these classrooms and are engaged? And I think we already know being a young black woman in a classroom, that can come with all kinds of different ways that right. that interface can be, whether that's right. attacked, questioning my authority, et cetera, et cetera. And then I come in and present with feminine artifice, with an attention to like, I love Beyonce, I love these kinds right. of things that people may read certain narratives onto that and may question my commitments to political things in the right. same way that folks who don't present in that way can be questioned for different, right. Um, right. exacting different kinds of gender performance. And I think I've attempted to start to do some work around it to think about the ethics of care, the ways that we can talk about pretty, the ways that we can talk about beauty, the way we can talk about the different ideas that circulate around gender performance and black femininity mm -hmm. and black women's existence in this. And although 
Bossip is hilarious, and <laughs> I, I, the article itself was a very interesting moment. I also embraced the opportunity to be able to have these conversations in an honest way yeah. and in a yeah. way that says, I deeply care about black women. I want us to win. I, in many ways, believe we all we got. And mm -hmm. so if I believe that and I anchor my work in that and anchor my work and being able to laugh at certain things, to have joy with black women, to be able to engage difficult moments in, in a sincere way, in a way that we can unpack some things together, mm -hmm. then I'm all for it. Um, my students typically haven't really known, I guess they'll know now, uh, <laughs> that, is, that is a something that happened. But I, you know, I think it's a, a way in, in certain ways, to do a certain kind of different public work. There's right. an audience that only knows me as Professor Ooh, Bay, right. Right. but it also brought them to work. It's like, oh wow, she writes about violence against black, black women. women, she right. writes about 19th century Washington, D.C. And I think that opens up possibility for some folks to imagine themselves doing this kind of work and still being a diva or being masculine of center or being mm -hmm. their truest self and bringing that into the academy. If we're talking to 11-year-old Treva Blaine Lindsay <laughs> um, and we go, you're going to grow up to become a black woman historian, uh, how does 11-year-old Treva Blaine Lindsay respond to that? She would be confused. She's like, a professor? What's that? She's like, I'm, I'm just trying to get my fly girl on because that at 11 was my goal was to be a fly girl on a living color. <laughs> so, which I'm still not giving up on because I have been convinced <laughs> to do this dance with Janet video. She's doing this virtual auditions to be right. the dancers for her new tour. So I do plan to do that. So I have not fully given up on that. My dance life is another part of my self-care practice right. that I've maintained and do. And I think Levy Oshiva didn't know that this was possible. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I knew any professors at that point. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anyone working on a campus at that point. But I'm sure my parents, speaking of 11-year-old Treva, actually might see not the professor, but someone who was publicly engaged, who was saying mm -hmm. that the world needs to be better, and that fairness is important, that freedom is important. I think that has been with me for a long time. And I think being a professor has given me a particular way in which to do that kind of work. The book is Colored No More, Reinventing Black Womanhood in Washington, D.C. The author is Professor Treva Blaine Lindsay, Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the <laughs> Ohio State University. The book is published by University of Illinois Press, 2010 PhD in History from Duke University. Welcome back as always. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back